Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and who made earth. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We come together rejoicing and are glad on this first Sunday after Easter. We are thankful for each one who has attended today, whether you are here in person or whether you are live streaming with us today. We're glad you're here. Traditionally, uh, it has been known in the church, as far as patterns of church behavior, uh, that this is Low Sunday, a Sunday where there's probably the least amount of people. They've come on Easter. Maybe Holy Week services have, have sufficed for a couple of weeks of, of missing, uh, missing, missing being in congregational worship with one another. Um, I'm glad to see today is not proving to be a low Sunday. Um, I always kind of, as a pastor, sort of dread that day because it, in my mind, at least, it should be the highest of Sundays having heard the good news of the resurrection uh, and being given an opportunity to participate and live into that. Uh, so we are thankful for all who have gathered here. Some of you who have gathered certainly with live streaming today, we're glad you're here as well, and we welcome you. This is going to be a busy month of April. April's already flying by with one week having gone by. Um, we will have this afternoon uh, the, uh, the Central Florida Master Choir. Uh, they will come and present a program at 3 p.m. Uh, it's always a, a wonderful sold-out event, meaning that we fill this place well, shoulder to shoulder. Um, so I'd urge you to get here a little bit early, probably 20 minutes early does, is, is enough. If you get here 10 minutes early, you may have some time squeezing into a seat or sitting in a place where maybe you can't see the full choir. Um, the program usually is, at, and the program will follow its normal pattern of having a serious, a fairly serious piece of music presented at the beginning um, and of, of the, the first half of the concert and then followed by a, a second, perhaps less serious, but nevertheless well-performed uh, portion of music. And so we welcome Central Florida Master Choir here. The deacons will meet on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, our normal pattern with Bible study and the like this week. Also on Saturday, we will come together for a, a DPC cleanup day. It's kind of a follow-up to the day that we had such success with a couple of weeks ago, um, finishing up a few of those projects before it gets too warm uh, for us. We also have some indoor projects, some things such as sorting books and doing those kind of things. So you don't, if you're not a person who's a yard person or that orientation, um, you'll be able to help us in that way and help us do some clean out and spring cleaning. Um, coming up, we have uh, many different activities that are, that are coming up. We are signing up in the Narthex. There's lots of things to sign up for in the Narthex. Two things you need to sign up for is, is we are creating a, a, a DPC picture, pictorial directory, and we're doing that um, on our own without going out to a, a company to do that. Um, we have um, David Davis, one of our members, who's volunteered to be the photographer for that. Um, and uh, he's a, he, he actually has pro professional credentials to do that as well. So come and get your, uh, your family's picture made or your own picture made. And that way we can have it included in an updated uh, pictorial directory. The sign-ups are out there with days and dates. Also, um, on the 20th, uh, we will have a uh, Presbyterian women's uh, tea. Uh, they had a wonderful tea party last year and are having it again this year. Um, one of the things that's a little different this year is, is that everybody's going to be asked to bring their own cup and saucer because usually there's a story behind a cup and a saucer. If you're not a cup and saucer person or if you've already given those away or whatever, Please come. Uh, I promise you there will be extras there. I know a few people who have pretty extensive collections of cups and saucers have volunteered to bring a few in extra um, for that. So if you can sign up for it just to where they know how many folks are coming, um, that sign up is also out in the Narthex. Um, the following day after the, after the 20th, we'll have another 
in our series, our Don Allen Presbyterian music concert series, this time featuring Faith O'Brien. Um, Faith is the church musician at, um, uh, at St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. Uh, she comes with a wealth of experience in playing. They'll be playing all, she'll be playing all sorts of music, everything from show tunes to sacred music that day. And she's going to be joined with, uh, by Father Ramon Bolete and, uh, and Anna, Marie, uh, Anna Mary Rodriguez, uh, who will be singing that day. So mark that on your calendars for the 21st as well. Are there any other announcements I missed this day? Let me see. Okay, good. Um, thankful that, that we remembered all of those. Let us now continue to our preparation for worship as we uh, come together uh, through the gift of music. That beautiful prelude was played by Ruth Volk. Ruth will be substituting for the next couple of weeks, and we're thankful for her being here uh, uh, in the absence of Sherry Thurkin. Um, Ruth uh, swore off um, playing the piano uh, in public, but she swore at me when I asked her <laughs> if she would do that and, uh, and, and went back on her prompt. No, she... she uh, uh, she knows that she does not play as well as she used to because she has this strange thing called arthritis in your fingers. She plays perfectly well, as you've all heard, but I know she's a little shy, but thank you very much, Ruth, for playing and, and, and playing that important role in the life of this congregation. We're thankful for that. Also, in the life of this congregation, a reminder that today, um, the Easter Lilies were a little off on their timing. If you see how beautiful they are today, last week, remember, a lot of them hadn't even opened up yet. Well, that's going to give you all the more opportunity to enjoy them at home. Um, today is the day where you can take your lilies with you. Uh, those of you who, um, uh, who, who made dedications of those lilies uh, and supplied uh, the lilies for uh, this time, please take them home with you. Um, we have the concert series this afternoon, and that's just one more thing for us to try to 
keep out of the way and in what becomes a very uh, busy chancel area. So we're thankful that. And speaking of busy chancel areas, um, it will be greatly appreciated if, if uh, those who could could stay after worship a little bit with us today and help us move a few things we need to move around. The, the master choir does an awful lot of that themselves, but we like to have our stuff out of their way. So if you can help immediately following uh, worship uh, and remember that uh, many hands will make the work very light. Now let us join in our call to worship into our fears and through our locked doors. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption. Amidst our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter fulfillment. For the sake of a community meant to be at its best during crisis. Come Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our hymn of gathering today is hymn number 240, Alleluia, Alleluia, Give Thanks, number 240. Let us stand together and sing this hymn of Easter. You may be seated. Let us join now in our call to confession, our prayer of confession, the words of our assurance of pardon, and the singing of the Gloria Patri. When we stand at the baptismal font and confess our sins, we are not doing so as lost, guilty, and ambiguous human beings who are not sure of our standing before God. We do not come groveling but we come confident as those who are no longer dead in our trespasses, but who already live alive in Jesus Christ. Without God's grace, we would not even know we are sinners. So we confess together, O oh Lord our God, we think our best should happen when we are in control. 
Forgive us for not expecting the risen Christ to show up when we are anxious, content to lock the doors of your house for fear of all that is outside. Forgive us for thinking that church mainly happens inside these walls and not into the world you so love and into which we are sent. Forgive us for looking for your power in all the conventional places, but never in places of brokenness, crisis, and defeat. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, repair what we are, and by the power of Christ's resurrection, raise us up to serve others for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. You are already forgiven, loved, and whole. In the spirit, we are not an isolated spiritual being doing Christianity alone, but we are part of a community of faith. Forgiven we go to build that. By the grace of God, every human being is seen, loved, and made whole. Amen. may be seated. Good morning. Please repeat with me the, the prayer of the illumination. Divine Redeemer, bearer of life, open us to the wisdom of your world today and enlighten us with your truth. Liberate us from all that distracts us and turns us from your path. Guide us and ground us in Christ's everlasting hope. Amen. The reading for today 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, 
put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This concludes the reading of God's word. Now may we hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Last week, if you were here, you heard the story, the gospel story of the account of Jesus' death as it's, and in resurrection as it's recorded in the gospel according to Mark. If you remember, there was, and where we stopped in our reading, there was what we call the shorter ending of Mark, what appears by different kinds of measures to have been the original ending of Mark and where they are left at that point is that they are left with having Mary and having come back and told the disciples the, about the empty grave and where we are left is that it left Mary and the disciples pondering and afraid pondering and afraid what that empty tomb meant. Well, we have three other Gospels that tell a further story, and as we know also, told further about the narrative, even Mark was added to, to add some more about that narrative, to tell us a little more. Today we have John, you, you heard from the Gospel according to John, probably the Gospel that has the most about Jesus as his post-resurrection appearances and where he met them and the like and has this marvelous story that sort of picks up from where Mark leaves off. Mark leaves off with the disciples and Mary Magdalene frightened, fearful, and afraid. And as Sally read this morning so well, it picks up with them in the same state of mind, the same sort of emotional place where they find themselves. They are fearful, fearful, that so fearful that they've locked themselves behind doors. They've locked themselves behind doors. And there's a tag there that says, for fear of the Jews. That tag of adding the for fear of the Jews is because there wants to be clarity, at least in John's gospel, that the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. It was the Jews' voices that they heard when they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, because it was the Jewish people who had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. It was one of those crowded moments of pilgrimage. They were afraid if the Jews, as the early church perceived it, had been the ones who had crucified Jesus, the one who had come to be the Messiah, the one that this small group of people believed to be the Messiah, that if they had gone after him, who knows if they would be the next ones up in front of Pilate. They were fearful. They were afraid. Where do you find yourself on this Easter, first Sunday after Easter? Have you heard the good news and locked yourself behind some doors? Whether those doors are the kind of literal doors where you're not coming out, not fully understanding what Easter means and what Easter has done and what Easter is doing, in your life? 
Are you fearful of what may come in our own future, our own political and national future? Are you fearful of what might happen in a, in a, in, in a place, in a time when strange events are happening, where wars are raging even though we can easily ignore them by just not reading the newspapers? Where strange things are happening with the earth. An earthquake two weeks ago off the coast of Florida. An earthquake that occurs in New Jersey, which New Jersey has more earthquakes than, they, than, than most of us actually understand and realize. There's just a nice fault line that runs up there that runs down through Richmond, Virginia. and So they have more than they think of it. And then there's other places that, that weird weather has happened and strange things have happened. And, and it's easy on this first Sunday after Easter to have fears. But the fears that were most in mind of those disciples that day, and of those disciples meaning the followers of Christ, not only those who were the apostles, but those who had gathered, was they were fearful. They were fearful, as it says, of the Jews but you know what? They had other fears as well. Because if we examine the record and leave it where it is, what had Jesus' own disciples done? They had abandoned him for the most part. Biblical record is very clear. That the only ones who were even near Jesus on the day of his crucifixion were the women who looked from afar. And one can assume from one of the last words of Christ that is spoken that John, John the Apostle, was near and with the women. But everyone else, what had they done? Peter denied Christ the three times. And if Peter the leader had denied them and run away, you can bet the others had as well. And so the fear on this first Sunday after Easter is, 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 is a dual fear, per, per, perhaps. is Are you going to be persecuted for your faith by either another religious group or by a governing body somehow? Or are you going to be indeed held accountable because they deserted him? Because you may have in some ways in your life Deserted God when God most needed you not to be the deserters. So we can be fearful to some degree, can we not? Every time we open our worship, we open our worship with a call to confession, a prayer of confession, and then the assurance of pardon, that moment in which we hear Jesus' words again to us as he spoke the, to them on that day in that room behind the locked door where he says, fear not, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not a person of retribution. I haven't come back to punish you. In this time when we hear so much, particularly in political rhetoric about how so-and-so is wanting to get back on so-and-so if they get re-elected again, whether it's on a school board or all the way up, into the highest ranks of our government, that indeed that somehow retribution is what the answer to all of our problems are, and that somehow we deserve that, the disciples learn a lesson that day, an important lesson that day, is that Jesus is for them. Jesus knows them. 
in a way that they fearfully don't even know themselves. He knows them to be sinners. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. It's clear in the narrative. He knew Peter was going to deny him. He predicted it. God knows that we're going to deny him as well. It's written in the DNA of all of our hearts and minds. Yet God somehow comes miraculously. In this case, how does Jesus come? He comes through locked doors. There's sort of this metaphysical event that shouldn't possibly happen that happens. He comes through locked doors to greet them. And in the midst of his greeting them, he says, fear not. And he goes further to assure them. And not only to assure them that they are forgiven for what they had done thus far, even in denying him. But he had a mission for them. He had a mission for them. And he breathes the Holy Spirit upon them. And he sends them out, sends them out from behind their locked doors. And when he hears that there's this one Thomas who, well, Thomas isn't so sure. He had been daring enough to go out from behind the locked doors. Who knows, he may have gone out to get water and bread or to get some sustenance to to supply the people who were so afraid. That when Thomas comes back, Jesus will do anything Thomas needs him to do in order to demonstrate his love for Thomas and allow Thomas to believe in the good news that Christ is alive, that Christ is not out to get him or anyone else. If you mean get him, seek retribution. But instead, Christ is ready. Christ is ready to trust them enough to send them out with the good news of the gospel. He trusts them enough to send them out with the good news of the gospel. Karl Barth wrote in 1948 this following quote. One never is a Christian. One can only become one again and again. In the evening of each day, somewhat ashamed about one's Christianity of the day just over. And in the morning of each new day, glad that we may dare to be one all over again, doing so with solace with one's fellow humanity, with hope with everything. The Christian congregation is of one mind in that it consists of real beginners. Those disciples gathered that day even though they had spent three years with Jesus. Came to understand they were beginners. And the pompous cries of, oh, I'll never let that happen to you again, that Peter once spoke, Peter knows that's not a truth. And as much as they wanted to seek out some kind of retribution for Jesus' death, for some reason if they wanted to hate their fellow Jews who had indeed had been part of this conspiracy that then the government then carries out to convict and then to kill an innocent man, that that wasn't the last word about who they were. Instead, Jesus comes 
frees the Holy Spirit upon them and sends them out to be God's people. To share the good news. To recognize that with each new dawn, the beginners are at their first day at work again. Remember your first day at work in whatever job you were in? Remember some of those feelings you had? Most of us probably weren't really confident. I can remember all the time from the time I worked in my first paid job at a service station back when, indeed, service stations were those full-time service stations where you could get your car repaired and all of that stuff, and, and that somebody came out and pumped your gas for you. What was my greatest fear? Is that somebody was going to pull up in a car where I did not know where their gas cap was. And I'm looking over at Charles over here. Charles can probably give you a list of 10 cars that had weird gas caps in, okay, in places the, in, under the tail light. There you go. I had that greatest fear, but you know what? Enough cars came through, enough cars came through. I never lost that fear completely, but I figured out that some people in Michigan had strange ideas. That time, most of the cars were made in Michigan. And goodness knows, if you had some European car come in, we just usually just said, you know, move ahead, move ahead. No, we didn't say that. But it was such a rare occasion that Mr. Beecher would come out and help me find that. But remember, remember your first day. That's how we are all are as Christians. It's always our first day on the job. But the beauty of being the first day on the job is even though, yes, we have experience that we can draw upon and and the like, is that the beauty of the first day of our job is that there's forgiveness there for us not knowing everything. For us not being perfect. We've all gone to cashiers before who said, oh, excuse me, it's my first day. As they put the dog food on top of your bread as they load it in your basket. Uh, It's not your first day having common sense, is it? No, but you you know the way that is. But you forgive the people, and it's our first day, folks. Every day is our first day. And you know how we survive our first days? It's always better if somebody else starts with you, isn't it? If there's two or three of you who that's the first day at work, well, at least you can kind of mumble and bumble amongst yourselves, and maybe one of you will find the right answer, and maybe it won't look quite as bad. It's our first day, and we recognize that all of us are first day folk. And we're going to come in here, and we're going to confess our sins. We're going to admit our finitude, we're only human, we're finite, and we're going to admit our sin and our need for forgiveness. And with that good news, the good news that indeed the disciples came to proclaim, came to understand the empty tomb, it is with that good news that we go every single day. Easter does not leave us in despair. The crucified and risen Lord is relentless. Is relentless. And never stops calling us. And never stops sending us. May we answer. And may we go. Again, and again, and again. Having once again disappointed God, and we all do. Not sulk, not sorrow. Ask and receive true forgiveness and go on. For God calls us to our next days in addition to living these days. And for that we can give thanks 
always. Amen and amen. Let us now affirm our faith. This comes from the study catechism, a catechism that was developed in the latter part of the last century to help us to learn, indeed, what we claim to believe. What do you affirm when you say that he was crucified, dead, and buried? That when our Lord passed through the door of real human death, he showed us that there is no sorrow that he has not known, no grief he has not borne, and no price he was unwilling to pay in order to reconcile us to God. What do you affirm when you say that on the third day he rose again from the dead? That our Lord could not be held by the power of death. Having died on the cross, he appeared to his followers, triumphant from the grave, in a new exalted kind of life, in showing them his hands and his feet, the one who was crucified revealed himself to them as the Lord and Savior of the world. God has blessed us, giving us everything we need and most anything that we want. He has blessed us with the opportunity to share that with this world, to send us out into this world with our time, our talents, and through our financial wealth. God has blessed us in that in receiving that wealth, we have been able to do that. Although, indeed, it may be tough times. We are thankful for all who have offered themselves their time, their talent, and their financial wealth. And we come before God this day asking God's blessings upon our gifts through this, our prayer of dedication. Good and gracious God, help us to say thank you, to live with gratitude, to look for the best in each other and live charitably with all. May your resurrection never stop surprising us, disrupting us, and transforming us until Christ's kingdom comes again. Amen. Let us continue standing, if you are able, and sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 526, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ, number 526.
You may be seated. Welcome to the joyous feast of the people of God. People will come from east and from west, from north and from south, and sit at table one with another in the kingdom of our Lord. This is our Lord's table. The Lord invites each one of us who believe in him to come to taste and to see, to experience that mercy, to experience that sense of joy the disciples first experienced in that room, locked away and afraid. Jesus meets our fears, our brokenness here at this table. Come to the table of the Lord. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your table that reminds us of your grace, your love, your life-giving power. We ask your blessings upon this table as we come together as a people. Remembering that today is not the only day. Remembering that you have been at work since before time, creating, maintaining, and sustaining, redeeming us from our sin, giving us new hope that is in Christ. We pray, O oh God, as we gather at this table, for those who cannot be at this table, for those who seek your blessing as they are ill, as they are traveling, as they are uncertain and unsure, as they feel a need to just take a day off, as they recoup and as they recover. We pray for those who are in their last parts of their lives and ask your blessing upon them that that part may be as meaningful as the rest of their life. We pray for the family of Dot Kennebrew this day and pray, O oh God, that even as she has passed into death, that she knows the resurrection life a resurrection life she experienced here on earth. Gracious God, we pray, knowing that we say peace, peace, when there is no peace. Be in those warring places. Bring peace. Help us to always remain human, to not degrade or denigrate anyone claiming they don't have that status because they too have sinned as we have sinned. Gracious God, be with us as we struggle sometimes to understand that cosmic battle between good and evil. Feed us at this table that we might know your grace and live in its abundance. Lord, hear us now as we pray for this world and for others in this moment of silence. Now hear us, Lord, as we bless this meal using the prayer that you taught us to pray daily, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was with his disciples at the table. And he took bread, and after he broke it and blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In a similar manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, 
This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. For every time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he shall come again. Now may the people of God come forward, receive the elements. You may partake of them here at the table or you may carry them back with you and upon instruction we shall dine together. Those who are not able to come here, be able to, uh, who, who may be uh, unable to come to the table due to mobility issues, an elder will bring the elements to you. Come taste and see that God is good. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Eat of it, all of you. It's the blood of Christ shed for you and for the remission of our sins. 
strength of it, all of you. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you come to us in this moment at this table. You speak those words that you've spoken long ago. Fear not, for I am with you. You speak also those words that send us, even as the Father has been sent, we are May we receive its blessings and share those blessings with others. In your name we pray. Amen. There are times in people's lives when they have had a significant moment in their faith journey. And that significant moment is a moment not to be always kept private, but to be shared to be shared with other believers as each one of us begin each day as a beginner. I'm going to ask Tim Townsend, please, to come forward at this time and to reflect in this moment, having come to the table, that which God has put upon his heart. Brothers and sisters, I feel as if God has spoken to me, and he's put something on my heart that I need to share with you. I need to confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. As the preacher spoke about just moments ago, this world is in turmoil. There's trouble everywhere. And he's put something else on my heart, and that is that this war that we are in is not a conventional war. This is a spiritual war. And that we all need to prepare ourselves spiritually. In Ephesians, Paul speaks to the church about putting on the armor of God. And I think we all need to do just that. And you might be, if you're not familiar with it, you might be saying, well, what is the armor of God? Well, the armor of God is a passage located in Ephesians 6, 13 through 20. And Paul first compels his readers to stand firm with God, with his strength, not ours. Paul explains that our struggle is less of a physical one than a spiritual one against our true enemy, the devil. Well, I looked up the, the armor of God, and the first is the belt of truth. One of the devil's favorite weapons is lies. Often he distorts the truth so that it can be hard to distinguish fact from fallacy. But if we ask God to give us discernment, the wisdom to know his truth above all others, then we will have the belt of truth the breath, breastplate of righteousness. Satan also tries to undermine our self-worth and questions our place with God. Anyone who struggles with self-esteem can fall prey to these tactics. But when we listen, we'll hear our Heavenly Father remind us of his unconditional love and our position in Christ. Fitted feet. The enemy wants to keep the people of God quiet. So he tries to plant seeds of doubt in us about how well we speak or if anyone will listen. But if we pray, God will provide the strength and boldness that we need to give our testimony and to praise him publicly without worry. The shield of faith. The devil's plan to derail our faith can include using situations and even other people. Our personal weaknesses can leave us open to temptations, discouragement, or wrong behavior. But if we admit our needs for his help, God will make us tough, will make us tough enough 
to withstand those trials. The helmet of salvation. The struggle with Satan often starts with our thought life. Any faulty ideas, anxieties, or fears that we may be holding on to can be amplified and used against us. But if we call on him, God will renew us so that our eyes and minds will stay focused on him throughout the day. The sword of the spirit. The enemy hopes to neutralize the power that we have through Christ. He aims to confuse us and intimidate us or scare us, hoping that we'll forget God's word. But if we seek him, God will fill us up with the confidence to declare scriptures and calm his and claim his promises for our lives. Seven is prayer. Satan desires to cut off our prayer, prayer life. He knows that without it, we are less aligned with our Father and less alert or prepared for attacks against us. But if we set aside time to follow with him, to fellowship with him, God will supply us with all that we need to make a positive impact for him. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to say a prayer for all of us because I think we all need to be prepared for what this world is coming to. So I'm going to say a prayer now, if you'll join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for being our protector from the evil one. His schemes are crafty and his attacks are vicious. But help us not to fear. Your almighty hand is more than powerful enough to deliver us. You have promised that we are, as Paul wrote, more than conquerors against the enemy. But in order to gain the victory, we must join in the battle. You call us to become spiritual warriors. Lead us to first seek your presence, then help us to understand your word better and to worship you more fully. Give us humility to admit our faults and to rely on your grace. Lord, thank you for each piece of the spiritual armor that we have been given. Keep the truth firmly in our hearts and minds. Make us ready to share the good news everywhere. And let prayer always be on our tongues. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That message that indeed proclaims loudly that Although this world with devils filled may threaten to undo us, God is indeed with us. Christ is alive. That's hymn number 246. Those who are able to stand as we sing, please stand as we sing hymn number 246, Christ is Alive.
Join me now for our sending. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The work of the church is not over. It has just begun. Go with joy where the crucified and risen Christ is sending you. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. Now may the beauty of God be reflected in our eyes. May the peace of God reside within our hearts. And may the love of God be the focus of our lives in this day and always. Amen and amen. Please be seated for the postlude and then remember that we need your help uh, moving around some things on the chancel after. Again, thank you, Ruth. Day. And he said, "Believe me, Lord, I have come as faith." Amen. Jesus saw. We know it. Just Jesus saw the candle coming toward him and said, "Here, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit." And then he came and said, "Man, how do you know me?" And he said, "Before Philip saw you, when you were on the gate of faith, I said, when you go off." God bless you. <laughs> Good friends, depart in peace. See you at three.